Great. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Christian, um, and I am. I live in Coralville, Iowa now. And but I um, actually retired from teaching school, high school, for 43 years, and moved from Baltimore last spring to uh, Coralville, which is about 10 seconds outside of Iowa City. And um, the last 39 years of my teaching time, I was fortunate enough to get a chance to uh, offer a senior elective on Dante's Divine Comedy starting in 1982 through last spring. And besides teaching Dante, Dante is obviously a wonderful, wonderful thing, but one of the best parts of the, of the experience was I got a chance to, to work with and read Dante with some wonderful, courageous and bright and um, students. And so I'm joined today with Hannah Gokaslin, who was one of those students um, and is now still and will forever be a, uh, uh, fellow uh, Pilgrim on the Road. So Hannah, I'll turn it over to you and you can introduce yourself as well. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Hannah Gokaslin. I am currently a senior at Middlebury College um, in Middlebury, Vermont, and that's where I'm um, Zooming from right now. Um, I study environmental studies and geography um, in Spanish. And um, yeah, I, I took Mr. Christian's class on Dante my senior year of high school. So that was fall of 2015. Um, and um, it definitely was something that I wasn't expecting um, to, I mean, I was excited about it, but it, I, I got so much more out of the class and out of the experience of, of learning from, from reading the poem with my classmates and with Mr. Christian than I, than I could have ever kind of predicted. So it's, it's, it's stuck with me um, since then. And I, you know, have been in contact with Mr. Christian since then as well. Yeah. Well, great, Hannah. So this is a, this is a real special treat. So we are in uh, Canto 27, and uh, in Canto 27 is um, is just a wonderful canto, and and it's uh, uh, Dante is just about to lead the seventh terrace uh, of Mount Purgatory, mm -hmm. and um, it's just uh, I was particularly struck this time rereading it about how much is actually there that I hadn't really noticed before. Um, so, and you had mentioned to me a few weeks ago uh, that this was a particularly special and uh, cool canto for you when you read it. So, can you? Uh, I mean, what what struck you particularly about Canto Twenty, uh, Canto Twenty Seven, the Purgatorio? Sure. Yeah. Um, there were there were a lot of things. I think primarily was the fact that I I was kind of reading some old writing I had done for the class and spent a lot of time thinking about Virgil and Dante's relationship and um, the way that that kind of Virgil being this, this person in limbo who could not actually go to paradise with Dante. This was kind of that moment where the pilgrim really um, kind of comes into himself. And I think that that Virgil's presence there and that support is like really, really um, embodied kind of in this, in this particular canto, I think about the lines um, where Virgil says to Dante, um, turn towards the fire and enter confident kind of that that encouragement and that that moment of showing how far through through traveling through hell and then also up mount purgatory with with the pilgrim seeing seeing his growth and i mean another special thing a reason why this canto is one of my favorites is that our class um you know hiked up a, a mountain to read it at sunrise and i think that that kind of like embodied experience with reading the text is also a reason why this particular canto has really, really stuck with me, um, even like so many years later. But that's good. Yeah, and I, you know, I wonder. I think you could probably, as a, you know, or not just you, but me or anybody else, that if you just, if we just focused on from Inferno One all the way through um, this canto, and if we just focused on that relationship between Dante and Virgil we would have a lifetime of a pretty rich and nutritious literary meal. Because mm -hmm. um, that relationship is unbelievably, uh, unbelievably special. So, uh, so I, I mean, I absolutely agree. I, I don't know if um, the fact, when you point out that he, when he tells Dante to, uh, to enter the fire confident and <laughs> which is a pretty rational, uh, and he goes through that whole sort of uh, litany of reasons why, you know, you can, Put your cloak in the uh, in the fire. Notice that it's you know it's it's not going to burn. You know you're not going to lose any hair off your head if you go through the fire. And so go confident, go near. That still doesn't work. Yeah. 
<laughs> it still doesn't work. And so he has to almost treat Dante like he's a six-year-old mm -hmm. and um, invite him and say, hey, listen, I think Beatrice is on the other side of the wall. Yeah. And like he just offered a child a piece of candy. And that seems to be the thing. So Dante goes from being, you know, passing on the adult rationale, but seems to respond to the, the childlike rationale. Mm -hmm. to to him to get him through the fire so every dynamic between Virgil being dealing with an adult son and dealing with a very very you know an elementary school son at the within the same experience is pretty is pretty pretty dynamic I think mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, and I, I think I think it's really interesting to think about that to kind of Beatrice being so present in this canto as well um, and kind of him being on the precipice. I mean, obviously there are more cantos in Purgatory, but I think that this one is really, um, like, like it's one of the times where we really do like mention Beatrice very explicitly and talk about her, um, kind of as a, in Dante's mind, like moving forward and, and, and seeing that, seeing her in, in paradise as, as something that he's, that is like what you were saying, kind of his motivation to keep going, even when he's feeling so uncertain and um, I think also that kind of shows just how, how well Virgil and Dante kind of know, we, how well Virgil can, the, their relationship is, is strong enough that Virgil knows, knows that that is what will help Dante move forward. And I think that that, like for that relationship being such an interesting part of the story for me is really, it's really great to see that here and, and really interesting to think about. Yeah. yeah, that's very, that's very well said, because she's not a, not, Virgil's not a, um, he's not this uninvested tour guide, you know, that he yeah. knows exactly the buttons to push for, I mean, it's as intimate a, a, a relationship of parent and child as, as I think you're going to find. Um, and I read an essay once by a man named Peter Calcavage, who taught at St. John's College, you know, in Annapolis, mm -hmm. and it was on Dante's Ulysses, and he made a really interesting point. This is a long time ago. This is back in the early 90s, I bet. He said that Beatrice isn't a character in the poem, that Beatrice is the point of the poem. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that, that Dante is able to, or Virgil's able to, to confirm the, the, the veracity of that statement while at the same time not being able to, as you mentioned earlier, not being able to participate in, participate in the very fruitfulness of heaven that uh, Beatrice represents. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, it's, uh, so I, what I, something I wanted to actually ask you, if you don't mind, because I think this, because I remember our, we talked about this, right? And Dante's story is the real teacher of the course. You know, I just kind of graded the, the papers on his back. I was like Dante's TA. Yeah. <laughs> that was wonderful, wonderful treat. My pleasure. Um, and when, when I went back through this, and I remember some incidental contact conversations that you and I had while you were, you know, in, in the class and you being such a strong, a strong, you know, reader yourself. Um, I went back, when I went back through this, I was particularly struck by, and I got a, just a couple of notes here so I don't, uh, so I don't mess up my point. I'm struck by, and you, and this is just a continuation of your observation, the relationship that Dante has with Virgil, particularly in this canto, because there are all, the, through Inferno, particularly all the way up to this point, there's all of these different titles that Dante gives to Virgil. Mm -hmm. Right, and there are just you know a plethora of them, but it's in this canto that Dante and Virgil, or Virgil, seems to be most Dante's father. And so I um, was thinking about this and trying again, as I've mentioned, going back through this, trying to figure out the relationship between. I mean, Statius is with them still because he had joined them back in Canto Twenty. And he also calls Dante in Canto 25 his son. In this Canto 27, Virgil refers to Dante twice as his son. Mm -hmm. And the last formal title that Dante the Pilgrim uses 
to, to the, I'm sorry, Dante the poet uses to refer to Virgil in this canto is my gentle father. Yeah. And so I'm, what I'm struck by is, so I was trying to figure out, okay, what's this dynamic between essentially Virgil has been a, the parent, literary parent of both of these people that are with him now. With Dante, Dante says, you were my master and my author. And, and Statius even says that the Aeneid was his, um, was both mother and nurse to him. Uh, in fact, he even became a Christian because of something he had read that Virgil had written. So I guess I'm trying to figure out if you have any, if you have any additional thoughts to how, and this picks up on something I had a ninth grader tell me many years ago, a wonderful young man back in like 2005 in a Charles Dickens discussion. And Charles Dickens actually died 150 years ago today. Um, so and he wrote David Copperfield. He's got the same initials, DC, as Divine Comedy. So. Um, and somehow my parents didn't even know this was going to happen, and they gave me DC as my own initials. So it all kind of kind of come together. But, um, that I wonder what if you have any thoughts of it. This this former ninth grade student said in a discussion of Dickens's Great Expectations, not knowing anything about Statius, he said that he thought that books could serve as surrogate parents. Mm -hmm. And if that's true. I'm curious about what you might think, A, do you think that rings true for you as the strong reader that you are? And what does it mean for you? Because you, both you and I, I'm a thousand years old now, but you and I are, I read a book, Hannah, then I'll stop rambling, but I read a book uh, that I thought was really cool that had a great title called The Child That Books Built. And I love the title. It makes a great reference to C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, that reading them was like grabbing hold of a live wire. So maybe right at this moment as we're talking, we are still children that Dante is continuing to build hmm. Dante's story. And so does that ring any, does that ring true to you, that idea? And if it does, I'm curious about what you think about you as the child of Dante, you know what I mean? Like the child of the books that you've read, and obviously Dante's story is certainly something you've read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting, an interesting way to think about it. It's, I think, I think part of me is kind of like, well, what, what really, what do we learn from our parents and what, what do our parents teach us and, and how does our relationship with them um, influence us? And I think when I think about it that way, it does make sense that books in a lot of ways and, and the stories that we interact with, and this is kind of coming off of, of your class, you know, you always said that we were fellow pilgrims with Dante reading the Divine Comedy, that it wasn't, it wasn't a passive kind of art that we were consuming, but that it was something that we were actively um, growing with and engaging with as Dante kind of was going through his own journey. Um, and so when I think about like in interacting with books and with literature like that, I do think that um, there is definitely like a similar kind of growth and, and learning that comes with that. Um, that is, is kind of parental in a way, in, in the mm -hmm. sense that that it's all in front of you kind of. And I think sometimes parents feel that way, like they're older and you feel like they yes. know more than you and, and kind of like reading, reading the Divine Comedy, right? Like this entire poem is sitting in front of you and, and what you have to do is kind of learn from it. And, and I think that a lot of literature, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's there, you just have to kind of in, engage with it. And that's, yeah. that's where that growth comes from. And so I think, I think in a lot of ways, it is kind of parental, because I think parental figures, whether it's like actually your parents or, or somebody else in your life kind of do have this, like, they, they, like, they tend to be older in a lot of cases, you know, like they, they have this like collection of lived experiences, just like a, a, a piece of work is like a collection of experiences. Yes, that, well said. Yep. Um, yeah, our, our process of, of learning from them and growing with them and how they influence our own ways of thinking and ways of being, I think is, is, is now that you bring it up kind of very similar in a lot of ways to like how we interact with books and how, I mean, books teach us things and, and we, we grow as we read them and, and learn from them and talk about them. And so I think that, that, that to me makes sense. And, and I think, you know, the Virgil and Dante relationship is a parental one. And also, like you said, is kind of 
there's literature there, right? Too like I mean, Virgil is is an author and right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> so so exactly. it, it is very literal sense. He's both a parental <laughs> figure and kind of the creator of of stories, and so yes. Um, I guess I think Dante would probably very much agree with that. I yeah, very well said. I I don't. Um, I tried so I. Um, so uh, yeah, beautifully said. I, and I, I went back. I'm trying to think about okay, Virgil as father, dad Virgil kind of thing. Yeah. And he, you know, he delivers his final speech to Dante right in this canto. Mm -hmm. And um, what I like about Professor Mandelbaum's translation is that, and other translations I've looked at, the literal says in Virgil's last speech, he says that. Um, um, the eternal fire and the, uh, or the temporary fire and the eternal fire, I have shown you my son. But Mandelbaum takes the literal and flips it and puts the my son first. Yeah, he does. <laughs> you know, which is, which is kind of a cool thing. So I was curious, and I'd never done this before, and I'm sure there are people that have done it, but I'd never done it before. I went back to find out when Dante the Pilgrim, what his final words are to Virgil. Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't say anything to Virgil directly, again, until after the beginning comment in Purgatory 25. Mm. So it's, it's relatively far back when he asked the question about, um you know how bodies in purgatory are able to how are they able to have what kind of bodies they have that can sort of be the gluttonous can deal with this and Virgil turns that discussion over to Statius and then Virgil Dante doesn't ask or say anything directly to Virgil again and Virgil doesn't seem to get miffed by that or he doesn't seem to get sentimental. It seems like Virgil as a parent, and you know, my, my experience certainly of my mother and father, certainly my parents, and my dad died 10 years ago, my mom's been dead for 40 years. But now that I'm living in an area where, um, was very close to where I grew up as a kid and got to go to college, I visited my parents' grave sites twice. And it's amazing how much smarter my parents have gotten now that I've gotten older. <laughs> yeah. I can remember them saying stuff to me that I said, ah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and now, you know, I, you know, don't jump on the couch or something, you know, mm -hmm. the couch. And now, I mean, I, I barely sit on my own couch now <laughs> because I had to buy the couch. Um, but I, Dante, Virgil remains parentally focused throughout and doesn't turn into a sentimental sap at even at the end. Mm -hmm. He never loses track of his mission that he had accepted all the way back in Purgatory in Inferno 2 um, and remains devoted to you know, staying on task, right? You hear teachers saying that to kids, you know, you got to stay on task. And so he's able to, uh, he's really, really able to do that. So, um, so yeah, and the fact that he's an author and a, and a potential parent, makes all kinds of, um, of, of sense. Apologize here, I wanna make sure that we're good with time. We still have about a minute and a half. So, um, so, I, so do you have anything, you know, um, my, my only, my hope, you know, my hope is Hannah, that, and Ver Dorothy Sarah suggests this, that, you know, when Virgil goes back, down, back to limbo, and you referred to him at the very beginning of our chat here, my hope for Virgil is that when he gets to the Terrace of the Pride, as he's walking down Mount Purgatory, because he's going to have to then, you know, go back up through hell and get back to limbo. I hope that Virgil encounters some scaffolding on the Terrace of the Prideful, and he sees someone from commissioned by God, and what um, is being carved into the mountain along with Mary and Trajan and David is Virgil's last speech to Dante, mm -hmm. because so that Virgil's final words and his mission can become an example of humility for uh, the future purgatorians. Yeah. Um, and um, of course, I, then, what, then what does he, what do he and Homer and all the other poets in limbo, what did they discuss 
with Virgil? What do they discuss when he gets back? Because yeah. I had this, you know, experience. It must be a pretty good chat between them when they say, so how was it? You know, what was it like? Uh, can he explain it? Do they, do they decide to protest limbo and say, we're marching out of here, just like people have been marching for justice for the last, you know, two weeks. Maybe limbo decides, hey, listen, Virgil's been at the top of the mountain. I think we can make an argument that we all belong in paradise, too. So yeah. I don't, so do you have any final thoughts before, before we wrap this up here? Um, not to put you on the spot here. Sorry. No, 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 totally fine. I think I, I've always thought about that too, kind of Virgil returning to limbo after this experience. And um, I remember in our class discussions, you know, this like almost like a sense of frustration because we've all grown so close to Virgil, you know, we are fellow pilgrims with Dante. And so then it's like, he's become a kind of paternal figure for us as well. And like this kind of frustration of, he deserves to be in paradise too, you know, like he, he's done all the work that Dante has done, if not more so by leading him. And so it's, it's almost like, it feels a little bit unfair. And so I do wonder kind of like how, and maybe that is like his humility, right. To like experience that, that's something that seems unfair and to, you know, accept it and, and know that like paradise is not where he's, he's going and to return to limbo and that, that to be kind of his existence. I don't know, but it's definitely, I've thought about that a lot. And I, I, I do wonder kind of, Virgil post the Divine Comedy. What what does that look like? What does so you can someday in your future uh, Dante Pilgrim life you can write the book, the novel <laughs> about Virgil's return. Yeah. So yeah. that would be fabulous. Well, yeah. we can we can, uh, we can wrap this up. This has been a wonderful treat. Thanks for having this, uh, for joining, for being a part of this fellow pilgrim conversation. So um, thank you. Take yeah. good care of yourself. You too. You too. Thanks, Anna. Bye. Take care.